As far as Dofar 280, comparing to the Apollo samples goes... Battle 2. Fight! We look up the paper for Dofar 280 and its cousins on the Lunar Sample Compendium website, and in it we find... An unusual discovery in Dofar 280, paired with Dofar 081, are the reduced minerals for silicite, ferdisilicite, and a new mineral hapkite that have been proposed to form by impact-induced vapor phase deposition in the lunar soil. Figure 8. Dofar 081 and its pairs have compositional features that make lunar feldspathic meteorites distinct from Apollo samples. They have high aluminum oxide, 30% by weight, and low ferrous oxide, 3.2% by weight. They have similar scandium and siderophile elements such as iridium, compared to Apollo 14 and 16 breccias, but lower samarium, thorium, and sodium. How much lower is samarium, thorium, and sodium? If we scroll down to its chemical composition table, Dofar 280 and Cousins has only 0.6 parts per million of samarium, as opposed to 15 parts per million in its Apollo counterparts. Thorium is only 0.2 parts per million in the meteorite, and 2 to 6 parts per million in the Apollo samples. Sodium oxide works out to be 0.31%. Not substantially different, but the contents for aluminium, iron, samarium, and thorium are. Only the Apollo 16 samples have comparable concentrations of aluminium and iron, and even then, there are more so overwhelming chemical differences. The titanium content of the Apollo 16 samples alone is more than five times higher than that of Dofar 280, and they have six times as much manganese as the meteorite. Likewise, Dofar 280 has only around half the amount of magnesium for Apollo 16 samples, which in turn contain around half as much as the samples from all the other missions. So it seems Dofar 280 is different from the Apollo samples in terms of aluminium oxide, ferrous oxide, samarium and thorium. And to top it off, it also contains three iron silicides not found in the Apollo samples one of which is believed to be a very common lunar mineral due to constant micrometeoroid bombardment. This adds to the fact that we have three other lunar meteorites which are unlike any basalt from Apollo, and another two that are distinct from the Apollo and lunar basalts. The fact that the Russian samples are not identical to the Apollo samples, as Webb pointed out, and the fact that Smart 1 kicked up different minerals. If I analyse a rock I picked up from the moon, and then send a probe up there to kick up soil for me to analyse, I expect to get the same results. Whilst on the subject of moon minerals, to date, only three new minerals were found in the Apollo samples. Arm Alkalite, which was named in honour of the Apollo 11 crew, Tranquilityite, which was named after the Apollo 11 landing site, and Pyroxferroite, which was later found to occur naturally on the Earth as were the other two minerals. New minerals like Tranquilityite, or Armalkalite, were found initially in moon rocks, but since their discovering, those mineral species have also been found on Earth. So much for the Apollo samples having something unique that can't be found in either terrestrial rocks or meteorites. Now, why did Webb even bring up the subject of Hapkite? First, he alleges that what the ABC said about different minerals was just a teaser to make the story sound more sensational than it really was. Now he tells us that they simply lifted a piece from one of their earlier articles on meteorites and attributed it to Smart One. Which is it? But there's also a third ABC Online article, a transcript from The World Today, which aired September 4, 2006, the day after the crash which not only says that the cloud of dust is an ongoing investigation, but includes a statement by Phil Edwards, officer in charge at Narrabri. Since propagandists love to attack an opponent over the occasional mispronunciation of foreign or otherwise unusual sounding names, I feel the need to point out that it's not pronounced Narrabri, it's pronounced Narrabri. You know, rhymes with by. Normally I wouldn't resort to the same tactics of my opponents, but frankly, I'm quite bri-curious as to how Webb could have screwed this one up. Firstly, 
The correct pronunciation for this facility was mentioned in the ABC broadcast that Webb attacked and quote mined. Observatories in Chile and Narrabri in New South Wales also were trained on the probe. I think that shows just how much of the news report he watched. I mean, if you prominently respond to a video, a video that contains the correct pronunciation of a word, and yet you still get it wrong, there really is no hope for you. Second, a link to an MP3 recording of this very broadcast can be found directly above the World Today transcript. They do this for all their broadcasts. I should know. I was on that show just months later when they ran their coverage on the Sydney premiere of Casino Royale. The correct pronunciation for Narrabri is mentioned twice in the radio show that Webb brings our attention to. Nerves were being rattled at the Australia Telescope facility in Narrabri in the moments before impact. Scientists in Europe were relying on the New South Wales facility and scientists in Tasmania to track the spacecraft's final moments. Officer in charge at Narrabri, Dr Phil Edwards. We had a bit of excitement yesterday because there was a storm front approaching us. But there's also a third ABC Online article, a transcript from The World Today, which aired September 4, 2006, the day after the crash, which not only says that the cloud of dust is an ongoing investigation, but includes a statement by Phil Edwards, officer in charge at Narrabri, which puts everything in perspective. He equates trying to fully understand lunar geology based on the limited samples brought back by the Apollo astronauts to trying to fully understand the Earth's geology based on a couple of handfuls of sand from the Sahara Desert. Finding new minerals on the moon, minerals different than those found in the Apollo moon rocks, is something that the scientific community expects to happen. So finding new minerals on the moon does not, in any way, prove or even suggest that the Apollo moon rocks are fake. Okay. First Webb insists that the ABC made up garbage about different minerals as a teaser to sound sensational. Then he says that they lifted stuff about new minerals from an old article on Hapkite and then falsely applied it to Smart One. Now he tells us that scientists expect to find different minerals. Which is it now? This is why I know I'd make a bad propagandist. I have no idea which of the conflicting stories I need to stick to. Why do we need to know more about the surface of the moon? Scientists have been able to examine lunar rocks since the Apollo missions. Dr Phil Edwards again. The moon's surface covers a very large area and all we have is moon rocks from a couple of small points on the moon. So it would be like if you uh, landed in the Sahara and uh, tried to base your understanding of the Earth on just a couple of handfuls of sand. Uh, the, we know that the Earth's surface is very diverse and we expect the lunar surface also has a great range of diversity. That might have stood up if... The area Smart One crashed into was vastly different from the Apollo sites. Smart One crashed in the Lake of Excellence, a lunar Maria region. We have samples from Apollo supposedly collected from various Maria regions on the moon. Apollo 11 in the Sea of Tranquility, Apollo 12 in the Ocean of Storms, and Apollo 17 in the Sea of Serenities. By looking at the chemical signatures, we find that the samples from all three missions have virtually the same chemical composition. The only difference is the Apollo 11 samples are enriched in titanium oxide. Otherwise, they are all about the same. Likewise, the average mineralogy is not that different either. The proportions of feldspar, olivine and pyroxene may vary in proportion, but the numbers from mission to mission are generally close enough. The only difference is the Apollo 11 samples are enriched in opaque minerals, such as ilmenite. That of course is because the Apollo 11 samples are high in titanium, which explains their abundances of these titanium iron oxide minerals. So overall, Maria samples are pretty much the same. Further, by comparing the Apollo 17 surface samples to core samples from the same mission, we see again that there is not an appreciable difference between the two. That covers the chemistry. As for the mineralogy, during the 9th Lunar Science Conference, J.C. Lau and his team presented this model for the Apollo 17 drill core data. It catalogues the depth to percentage ratio of the various minerals found in the deep drill sample. All the common minerals are there. Plagioclase, olivine, pyroxene, opaques, etc. 
While the percentage of these minerals may vary somewhat as the drill goes deeper into the ground, nowhere is it stated that minerals different to those on the surface were found. On page 33 of their book, Mason and Melson wrote up this list of the minerals found in the Apollo 11 surface samples and divided them up into three groups. Major minerals, minerals that exceed 10% by weight, minor minerals, minerals that range within 1-10%, to and accessory minerals, minerals that are less than 1%. Pyroxene and plagioclase are both major minerals in the surface samples. Although ilmenite is a major mineral in the Apollo 11 rocks, it's a minor mineral in all the other Apollo rocks, as they are relatively low in titanium. And so for the other missions, it can be listed within the 1-10% to range along with olivine. Looking back to the core samples collected only 1 meter below ground, we find that these minerals do not deviate by much outside those ranges. It is important to note that all three of these missions were allegedly retrieved from the Lunar Maria. Smart One also crashed in the Lunar Maria, albeit in the Lake of Excellence. If the samples we have from the Lunar Maria are any indication, we should expect to find the same chemical compositions and mineralogy at the Smart One landing site. Yet Smart One found different minerals. To say that this would be expected would be like saying that you expect to find a difference between sand at Manly Beach and beach sand in Hawaii. Hell, even Phil Webb's hero, Randy Korotev, is convinced that the lunar rocks should be the same throughout. On his site, he states, As noted above, there are known exceptions to the generalizations, and we lunatics surely hope that we haven't discovered all the minerals and rock types that occur on the moon. However, known samples of unusual composition and mineralogy are rare, and usually occur only as small, less than one gram, clasts in breccias or in the soil. We have no reason to suspect, based on data obtained from orbit on the Clementine and Lunar Prospector missions, that any region of the moon is rich in types of rocks significantly different from those we know about or postulate might exist. Most ore-forming processes on Earth involve water, so we would not expect any hidden ore deposits on the moon. Keep in mind that if more than 40 lunar meteorites have been blasted off the moon and found on Earth, then at any given point on the lunar surface, there can be rocks from any other point. For this reason, the fact that the lunar surface was poorly sampled by the Apollo and Luna missions is in itself not a good reason to suspect that rocks vastly different from those we have studied exist at unsampled points on the moon. Tens of thousands of lunar rocks and rocklets have been studied since the Apollo missions. It is highly unlikely that any yet unfound lunar meteorite will differ substantially in the minerals it contains or in its geochemical character from the Apollo lunar rocks. Of course, Nina reminds you that the Clementine and Lunar Prospector are NASA missions. I'm sure those instruments can tell you whatever NASA wants them to tell you. It seems NASA has painted themselves into a corner by having their space probes send back falsified data that indicates that the moon in general is made of identical or similar rock to the Apollo samples. They obviously didn't consider Australia's independent press picking up on the different minerals that Smart One found, did they? Given how rampantly Phil Webb plagiarised Randy Korotev throughout his entire critique series, he must therefore have complete trust in Korotev's authority on lunar geology and therefore his stance that no one should expect to find vastly different minerals at unsampled regions of the moon. Consider also, in his previous video, he cited the remote sensing performed by NASA's Clementine mission as evidence for the Apollo samples. This is the same probe that Korotev cited as proof for the lunar geology being the same throughout. If Webb uses the data from Clementine, he must therefore have complete trust in its data that indicates there is no reason to suspect any region on the moon would contain rocks different to the Apollo samples. Otherwise, Webb again stands guilty of cherry-picking, quote-mining, and misrepresentation. Evidently, this is the most likely case, as he avoids mention of this section from Korotev's site and instead favours a statement made by Dr. Phil Edwards who says the exact opposite. 
I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Phil Webb evidently cherry-picks whichever source is convenient to his argument at any given point in time, even if it contradicts something he said earlier. And he has the gall to accuse me of logical fallacies? There are many other claims that Webb makes in his next video.